Five minutes? Right. When you play live, magic happens. It's... There's something... And playing, for, playing in front of an audience actually creates magic too. There's definitely a transaction of energy between the audience and the musicians. And the way the music kind of manifests this energy in the space, when the space is being held by all these people who are focused on, on soaking it up, I mean, that's, that's powerful stuff. And you cannot replicate that under any other circumstances. And I was there in Kyoto recently, and I wanted to... Um, Kyoto's a historical city that is really well known for temples and a lot of older traditional history. And I wanted just to kick back and chill out and get my Zen piece on. And I said to a friend of mine, I'm like, where can I go? And she suggested a, a temple called Nanzenji. And Nanzenji has this beautiful Japanese garden in there, which was made for one of the emperors. And Japanese gardens, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with to some extent, the whole, the whole point with them is, how can, we, how can we create something that is so perfectly balanced and so manicured that it's natural and it reflects nature? It's this kind of dichotomy of like absolute control to create something that's absolutely natural. And for me, there's a lot of, that sits me very deeply in, in my musical process and a lot of other aspects. And this garden at Nanzenji was so beautiful. So this next piece is inspired by this day spent in this idyllic, amazing surrounding. I'm Mark the Glyblo. I mean, I'm a musician. I, I, I feel like a jazz musician in the purest sense of the word. Like, I, I like to be spontaneous and improvise and work with whatever I have, which might be just a piano. It might be drum machines and samplers and synths. Um, I might be in the studio. I might be on stage. It could be for the dance floor. It could be for, like, a mental trip out. It could, it could be one of any things. And, if I wanted to kind of say, what's that called? I mean, to me, that's what a jazz musician is. You know, it's not so much, I don't mean that like playing the language of jazz so much as how I perceive it as, a, as an ethos and a creative approach. So I was born and grew up mostly in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, my mum's Japanese and my dad actually lived in Japan for 20 years. So he, as good as turned native, you know, totally bilingual, bicultural, so the way we were raised in New Zealand, my brothers and I, it's like our house was my parents' own private Japan in Auckland, New Zealand. Like the garden was Japanese and the, the house was, like, was Japanese style. We'd eat Japanese, we'd speak Japanese. And um, it was almost like once you leave the property, then, then you're in New Zealand. <laughs> um, so that, that was, a, it was a really cool way to grow up and it was unique. I mean, I, I had no peers who were similar. It, I definitely have to look beyond New Zealand to find, you know, my roots. And Japan provided a lot of that. You know, growing up I was in Japan once a year from age 10, like every summer holiday. And then I finished high school there. Um, so it really, it really became a second home to me. But also culturally, just a touchstone. It's like, yeah, I can relate to this. I, I get this. So it's kind of interesting, you know, having two halves of you, yourself where you really get two different things and trying to bring those together. It's been a trip, but you know, something I'm really grateful to have that combination. I started with piano, and my dad decided when I was four years old, you will learn the piano. I, I didn't even have a choice about it, so that was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, piano is the starting point. It was, it was all classical lessons, and I wanted to improvise and play modern music and jazz and the, my teacher, teacher had no idea how to do that so I stopped with that teacher and I basically I guess was self-taught with modern piano but I, I ended up stopping playing for a decade when I lived in London and I think that's because 
you know, like I said, my dad forced me to learn this instrument. I didn't choose it. So I didn't feel like I had my own emotional relationship with it. So I had to leave it for like a decade. It wasn't until I came to LA and reconnected with it that I was like, oh wow, yeah, the piano, that's like, that's my first instrument. You know, a producer would be like, Mark, let's put some piano on this track. It's like, nah, man, let's put some synth on there. <laughs> I was just sidestepping whenever I could. Um, and you know, I, I dabbled a bit when I was growing up. Like I played a little bit of violin, a little bit of saxophone, messed around with some mallets, like xylophone and vibraphone. But no, I mean, I, I didn't spend enough time with any, any of those instruments where I'd feel like I can play that. Like, I could probably pick up a guitar and play a chord and sample it and then cut, chop it up and reprogram it. Um, but for me, yeah, primarily the keyboard as a musical interface, that's been the main thing. So there was a point when I was, I was quite young and people would say to me, you'll regret it if you give up, you know, you'll thank your dad for this and all this, and it's like, whatever. But of course they're right. I mean, I, I wish I'd spend more time with the piano on a, on a, in classical music. You know, there's some amazing, amazing depth of artistry in that music and what it brings to you as, an, as a player is, is unparalleled. Um, but you know, I was young and headstrong. I was like, nah, I'm, I'm out. Pretty much as soon as I started playing professionally, I really appreciated it. And that would have been in New Zealand. I was like, probably 21, um, and started playing playing jazz gigs. And it worked. You know, people enjoyed the music, the audience built, and we got to do more gigs. And so I did appreciate that, yeah, I'm making my living off playing the piano. And as much as I wasn't impressed with my dad's you know, method, I appreciated what he did for me. I mean, playing, playing in different settings is a different emotional and mental and spiritual experience for me. We call this the church sound system. It's all about soulful sounds, sounds that make you feel good. My name is Mark the Clive Lowe. Thank you all for coming out today. I'm going to make some records for you. Is that cool? Like, Shauna was playing some records for you, but I'm going to make some records for you, that's, if that's all right. I love, like with church, still really super musical, but it's underpinned by you know, beats and electronics. I love that, and when the crowd is really is realizing that, you know, there there isn't a DJ playing records for them. There's a guy kind of me like a DJ, but I'm making records for you. You know, when they when that kind of penny drops, and they're loving the music, it's it gets a little transcendental sometimes in a, in a kind of a, in a DJ culture kind of way, and that's that's a vibe. We have the dance floor rocking. Heritage is a whole other vibe. I think it's much more nuanced, and and there's touches of what I love about dance music in it, but they're more subtle, and it's more of an experience where I would imagine people would want to sit and kind of almost take it in as a meditation. You know, if it was too extremes, it would be almost be like ambient music and techno, but they're not that extreme away from each other. But you know, those two musics are related. And you can see how the same person can love them both in different circumstances. And that's what I do. It's, it's like, if you, uh, if you want to come to all my gigs, you're going to see very different things. You know, some stuff might be really weird. Some stuff might be straight dance floor and everything in between. I love that. I mean, I wouldn't want to play the same gig over and over and over again. <laughs> It's 
takes about 45 minutes to set up. Um, the, the, the equipment I use and how I use it, the workflow, that's been a work in progress for, I'd say, whew, almost 20 years. It started with an MPC and an analog synth and a Rhodes. And as technology evolved, the setup evolved. And as I'd, as I'd imagine more things I want to do, I'd have to work out different ways to do it. And then you know, computers really came in in a big time, in a big way. So I eventually changed the rig from analog to digital. And now at this point, it's like a playground. I mean, if I, I if I imagine something, I can just create it. You know, it's kind of, it's like having a vocabulary. You know, if you if you know words and you have a thought, you can make a sentence. It's that simple. When the technology doesn't work, it can be a little challenging. Um, but I've gotten pretty good at troubleshooting. You know, while I play. Uh, but yeah, it just, it's, for me, it's like the ultimate kind of canvas and palette. You know, I have all the paints I could want, all the brushes I could want, the, pat, the canvas is there. Now I just got to bring it to life. So on, on Heritage, I have, all that, I have all that equipment, but I'm using it in a more subtle way. Like I'm, I'm running live effects on the piano and the horn players. I'm sampling the horn players or the piano or the keyboards. Um, I'm programming a little bit of percussion. Like, you know, at church, I'm just banging out kicks and snares and like beats. But with Heritage, it is more nuanced. And I want the live drummer to be the primary drummer. So I'm basically programming like additional kind of perc percussion samples and stuff like that. So you should watch out for the three bar phrase. I'm gonna try to like, uh, like if you play, I'm gonna try to like play it a bar, like one bar past you, you know what I mean? No, I think Like if you start it, it I'll, I'll start the thing, hit a bar left. I'm gonna try to do that. I see what you're thinking about. Chase this? Yeah. Let's just practice that so that if you do that, it doesn't throw. Oh, each, 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 okay, so. okay, yeah. So we'll play a little bit more. I never used to rehearse. <laughs> I was just like, nah, the music is what it is. Um, but now I, I tend to rehearse more often, I guess. And all I'm trying to achieve is to have everyone in the band familiar with the, the motifs, so that the melody which constitutes the composition and the chords that go with it. You know, usually in rehearsal, I'll stop everyone playing as soon as we're through the melody. It's like, you know what it sounds like? Now when we get to this, when we do this at the gig, everyone's gonna be understanding what the plan is with the melody. After that, it's anyone's game. You know, that's when the magic really starts to happen. It's like these compositions just kind of set the, set the foundation for the moment, and then collectively as a band, we bring that moment to life. And you can't practice that, yeah.